Welcome to Public Health On Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Our focus is the novel coronavirus. I'm Josh Sharfstein, a faculty member at Johns Hopkins and also a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal with this podcast is to bring evidence and experts to help you understand today's news about the novel coronavirus and what it means for tomorrow. If you have questions, you can email them to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, Colleen Berry, the chair of the Department of Health Policy and Management at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, talks to Brendan Nyan, a professor of political science at Dartmouth and an expert on the politics of misinformation. They discuss how to prevent transmission of misinformation about the coronavirus, how to counter misinformation when it gets out there, and what it all means for helping people take care of themselves and their communities. Let's listen. Brendan, you are an expert in the politics of misinformation about health, including during disease epidemics and outbreaks. Give us a snapshot of the kinds of questions that interest you. Well, I'm most interested in why people believe things that are false or unsupported about the world. I started studying those questions in the area of politics and public policy, and then I started to look more specifically at health, uh, looking at the debates around the Affordable Care Act in 2009 and 2010, uh, looking at beliefs about the safety and efficacy of vaccines, and then most recently looking at beliefs about emerging disease outbreaks, most specifically around Zika in Brazil. What do we know about whether people are getting misinformation about the coronavirus? And are there things we can do to prevent misinformation from getting out there and sticking? We don't know as much as I would like. We know that people say they're being exposed to misinformation about the coronavirus. If we ask them in surveys, many people around the world report seeing misinformation. We're not sure, though, whether they're accurately recognizing the misinformation that they're being exposed to. In some cases, they may see things and not believe them, and they turn out to be true and vice versa. So it's hard to diagnose in real time, but it does seem like there's a lot of misinformation from the anecdotal reports as well as the kinds of content that's being observed circulating, especially on social media. So let's get a little bit more concrete. Give us an example of the types of false claims we're hearing about. One that I recently heard is the coronavirus is being caused by 5G cell phone towers. Let me say clearly, there's no truth to that claim. What else are you hearing? I would say the two biggest threads in the misinformation that are out there are, on the one hand, claims about cures that are false or unsupported by science. Things like garlic can help cure COVID-19, vitamin C, various other kind of huckster-style products that are being marketed as as, as cures or, or things that would protect you against the disease on the one hand. And then on the other, there are conspiracy theories about the origins of the virus, that it was engineered in a Chinese lab, for instance, right? And there's an ongoing debate about whether this this virus could have escaped from a lab, but the scientific findings seem to indicate that it is natural in origin and that there's no evidence for that, you know, some sort of bioweapon or, you know, these various conspiracy theories that have circulated widely in the last few weeks, especially. So we know that misinformation is out there on lots of different issues. Can you talk about what the human costs are of misinformation in the context of this pandemic? Yeah, they're potentially significant. One of the challenges in fighting misinformation in the political realm is that the stakes are very low for any individual person. It doesn't actually matter in your life very much if you know whether 9-11 was an inside job or whether Iraq had weapons of mass destruction immediately before the U.S. invasion. But of course, it does matter if your false beliefs about COVID-19 put you or your family or members of your community at risk because you don't take those warnings seriously, because you don't engage in appropriate social distancing practices and so forth. So the human cost can be potentially very real. And in some cases, the supposed cures that are being marketed to people too could put them in in danger. Uh, There were claims about using bleach to try to cure yourself from COVID-19, which would of course be extremely dangerous. So, you know, the stakes can be very high here, and I do worry about whether we're taking them seriously enough. 
So in a real sense, having misinformation about COVID is out there can matter in a life or death way. That's right. That's right. And and I think it has changed how we think about these questions. In politics, there's an appropriate deference to the nature of political speech, which often includes false claims. And we tolerate those as the price of living in a free society. I think when it comes to health, though, we're, we're less circumspect. There's a social consensus that we do need to be more aggressive about trying to prevent people from being exposed to those false claims because they can be so dangerous. And that's why, for instance, the platform companies have been more aggressive in trying to counter misinformation on COVID-19 specifically. So for the public health community, one of the most vexing developments has been the emergence of conspiracy theories around the virus or this idea of it being a hoax. How do these campaigns of misinformation develop and what can we do to counter or to correct them? Yeah, this is a difficult question. I would say in some cases, these theories are uh, bottom up and in some cases they're top down. And what I mean by that is in some cases we see conspiracy theories that are really created by political elites or other kinds of people who have a public platform and disseminated widely. So the death panel claim, for instance, uh, was coined by Sarah Palin, the former vice presidential candidate, and helped create a myth about the Affordable Care Act that had an important effect on the debate over end-of-life care, right? In other cases, we see these conspiracy theories that largely arise from the bottom up as people try to make sense of confusing or threatening circumstances that may produce a search for explanations and a lack of control that motivates people to try to find some explanation that would rationalize what they're experiencing. We see that often during disasters, tragedies, disease outbreaks. Those are circumstances when conspiracy theories often um, gain a foothold because they're psychologically appealing to people. And this seems to be one of those cases. There are a handful of elites who've amplified these sorts of of claims. I certainly wouldn't claim that every uh, politician has spoken accurately about this issue, but I do think some of the most extreme hoax cases seem to be more kind of bubbling up from the grassroots uh, with maybe a handful of exceptions. So you alluded a minute ago to social media. Does social media exacerbate problems of misinformation generally and about the virus specifically? For sure, for sure. We've always had misinformation. Social media didn't create the problem of misinformation, but they potentially amplify it because false claims can circulate so quickly. And the most viral, if you'll pardon the expression, claims can disseminate much more effectively than in the past. Right? So when people coin especially memorable false claims, these can uh, you know, reproduce just in the, in the way that we would expect you know, with natural processes out in the world, and they, they can disseminate more widely. So I think social media has created this kind of petri dish where some of these false claims can circulate and ultimately reach much larger audiences potentially. Again, they didn't create this problem, but they may amplify it. And, you know, people worry about the consequences of that kind of exposure that people are potentially getting as social media platforms have become such an important source of news. So then platforms respond, right? So how, explain to us, how does social media content monitoring or policing of misinformation about COVID actually work in practice? What does that look like? Yeah, so... The COVID-19 misinformation is being put into one of the special categories by the platforms. So there's a whole series of kinds of content that they essentially leave alone, like the kinds of political speech we were talking about earlier. But there's certain kinds of information they identify as particularly harmful and try to remove. And this is one of those categories. And so they're using a combination of artificial intelligence approaches and human moderation. In some cases, the platforms reportedly are actually partnering directly with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention or the World Health Organization to remove dangerous or harmful content that's been identified by those organizations. Again, the argument is that these are types of content that are so dangerous or threatening that this kind of action is needed. This is not intended to be the norm. This is not something that can be scaled across every piece of information on these platforms, but this is a pandemic and the health consequences are such that they're willing to take these more aggressive steps through that combination of computational and human interventions. Okay, that's really helpful. So let me switch gears for a moment um, and say that we've seen an increase in political polarization 
in our country that is sometimes mirrored in the new, the news sources people rely on, Fox versus CNN. Do politics make things worse? That's a big question to ask a political scientist. Um, I'll, I'll say that um, what we might worry about most here is that this issue of COVID-19 becomes politicized in the ways that we've seen other scientific issues become politicized. Just as climate, for instance, we've seen intense factual polarization on that issue. The worry is that we might see the same on COVID-19. And there have been signs of it. I guess I, what I would, I would characterize this as a kind of a mixed picture right now. It's certainly true that Fox was covering this issue very differently than other cable channels, for instance, until the president declared a national emergency, and then there was something of a pivot. Similarly, we've seen uh, some convergence in concern about COVID-19 across partisan lines as elites have started to have a more unified message about its severity. So I don't want to suggest that this issue is equivalent to climate in the sense of being intensely polarized in the way that we've seen in those debates over in recent decades over climate change, but the threat is there. And I guess what we have to do is try to strike that balance between, on the one hand, respecting the science and hopefully not becoming polarized in our beliefs about the science just because of which side of the aisle we're on, while on the other hand, of course, having a political debate about how to respond, which implicates our values and our priorities in a way that's inherently and essentially political, right? We have to be able to hold both those ideas in our head at the same time, that there's a, there's a set of scientific facts that everyone needs to understand in order to respond effectively to this debate, and then we need to bring our values to bear in thinking about how to address those those challenges. And if we can do both, then I think we can do quite well. Well, let me push on that, though. It isn't part of the problem that there is so much scientific uncertainty, that is, so much we still don't know about the coronavirus? Yes, you know, absolutely. And, and that creates an opening for these conspiracy theories, for instance, where scientists can't definitively rule out certain kinds of claims, or where revisions in our scientific understanding may create openings for people to exploit. We've certainly seen that in the climate debate, right? When projections are revised, when understandings are altered, when models turn out to perform less well, skeptics or critics will, will highlight those changes, which are, of course, an essential feature of the scientific process, which is intended to be self-correcting and, and use those to try to chip away at beliefs about the validity and legitimacy of science overall. Right? And so I do fear that same, that same problem here. We're so early in this process. We know so little. Our understandings will change so much. Right? So maintaining the consensus around the need to listen to scientists and to have those facts be part of the debate as we understand them, while also acknowledging that those understandings are inherently provisional, that's going to be a very tough balance to strike. So the scientific community are our important communicators right now. Very much so. And of course, the threat of the virus is um, more near and present in some parts of the country relative to others. Are people more motivated to track down the most accurate information when the threat feels more immediate versus more distant? I would say that's what the scientific literature suggests. We may have what's called an accuracy motivation when we're gathering information about an issue like this. We might also have, if the issue becomes politicized, what's sometimes called a directional motivation, Will, uh, you know, a hope or willingness to see that one side is right or to come out on one side of the debate. And what we might infer is that when the threat is more salient, people would be more motivated to seek out accurate information because it would help to protect them and their family, the stakes are higher, and so forth. At the same time, though, we are seeing partisan differences in certain kinds of behaviors and information seeking that suggest that it's not strictly a matter of threat alone, right? So there's, there's scientific research coming out now, for instance, it's finding differences in social distancing practices by partisanship, even once we account for things like case prevalence. So it does seem like this isn't strictly about the nature of the threat, although that does seem to be conditioning people's responses to some extent. Okay, last question. Some have gone so far as to say that the pandemic is straining the fabric of our democracy. As a political scientist, Brendan, do you see it in that way? I don't see it that way yet, but I do want to put it, this, these events in a larger context. Right now, we're seeing a trend towards democratic erosion around the world, and we've seen in other countries that leaders have used the context of the pandemic as a way to further processes of democratic erosion. 
So I do think there are reasons for concern. I'm one of the organizers of a group called Brightline Watch that monitors the status of U.S. democracy. And many observers of American politics are concerned about potential democratic erosion in this country. So we are already in a context in which there were concerns about democratic erosion. And we might worry that this process could, of responding to the pandemic and the, the government powers that have to be used in that sort of circumstance and so forth, might create openings for further democratic erosion. So I do think there are reasons to worry. The threat is more potential than real, I would say, in the United States at this point, but we should be absolutely uh, vigilant about maintaining our democracy, even under these extraordinary circumstances. Brandon, thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to Public Health on Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Please send questions to be covered in future podcasts to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. This podcast is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Lamare Morales. Audio production by Niall Owen McCusker and Spencer Greer, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening.